to see Brother George and Sister Elsie back there this morning. Praise God. Let's give them a big old hand this morning. Thank God. No, I'm glad, though, boy. That's wonderful. It blesses my heart. Blesses my heart. I'm glad Brother George is doing better. And we need to keep lifting him up in prayer. If you have your Bible, turn with me. First of all, the book of Ephesians. Then we're going to be going back into the book of Romans again. Ephesians chapter or Luke and then into Romans. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, short verse here. Let's ask that the Lord would touch this message to our heart. I believe it's a message that we need in this last day. Father, I ask God that you touch us, help us just to speak the things that are needed, nothing more, nothing less. Let your word go forth, let it accomplish, and let it bring to pass what you send it forth to do. Lord, I can't say anything without your anointing and without your touch, but God, you know exactly what is needed. And let the word go forth and be proclaimed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I really believe with all my heart, and I'm going to get into the message here in a moment. The things that I said a while ago, I really believe with all my heart, Jesus is soon to come. I see apostasy in the church. I see the churches getting cold. I had someone sit in front of me this week and talk about uh, the church where they had left and how cold it had gotten. I see these things happening. Church, it is time. This is exciting times we live in. Well, not hang our head down. What did Christ tell us? Lift up your heads. When you see these things coming to pass, don't get the mully grubs. Us Christians get the mother grubs too easy. Don't get discouraged. Don't get despondent. Yeah, there's, there's awful, awful, awful things coming on the face of the earth. But my Lord is soon to step out on the clouds of glory with the voice of the shout of the archangel. The trump of God's going to sound. Brother Tony, the dead in Christ is going to rise first. Now some shit trusting in. I'm not going to go to meddling. I'm going to preach. But some shit trusting in a politician to save them. Some folks thought that was the greatest thing they ever heard when their man, ain't calling no names, said he's going to run again. He's not your salvation. He's not your deliverer. Oh, it's getting quiet now. God, look into him. He's soon to come, Jesus Christ. Ephesians, I'm going to quit meddling. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. <clears throat> Listen to these words, Ephesians 6 and 18. I want to talk about the Spirit will bring us into victory. Again, not walking around with the mully grubs or with our head down, but victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. <clears throat> but Brother Doug, you don't know what I'm going through with. No, I don't, but he does. And as we look into it, he's brought you to this place for a reason as we get into his word this morning. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I want to ask you a question before, go, before I go on. Do you pray your way through the day? Or do you wait, getting down where we live, or do you wait until you just need Him? We want to start our day before we ever set our feet on the ground. God, help me through this day. Let me step out in your grace. If you don't need that of the morning, then remember me and pray for me. Because I sure hate when that alarm clock goes off. Pray our way through the day. Prayer, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Luke 18 and verse 1. Christ speaking unto them, it says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that man ought always to pray and not to faint. We need to be a praying church. 
We need to be a praying church. He gives this illustration saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of my adversity. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God. Think about God who loves us. God who created us and made us. God who has begun a good work in us. And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him though he bear along with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh shall he find faith on the earth. Church, we need to pray big. We need to pray big and believe God. We need to grab a hold of God and know that He will make a way for us when there seemeth to be no way. Turn with me now to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to start with verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Do you realize the Holy Ghost of God makes intercession for you and me? There's been times that I know not what to pray. Now you might not ever been in that straight, but I have been. Not know what to pray, not know how to pray, not know what to ask for. And the good Holy Ghost of God come down and, and move over me and with groanings and with utterings and with tongues began to make intercession to God the Father. Brother Doug, do you believe that? I believe it. I know it. I've seen it come to pass. And God do the work. Amen. Times when I did not know what to pray or how to pray, the Holy Spirit will intercede on our behalf. I see what the Spirit has done in my life and how He brings it to pass. When we surrender, that's the problem. Boy, it got quiet. That's the thing we don't like to hear is surrender. Humble ourselves before God. Why? Because I want it my way. Come on. I want it done the way I want it done. I want it to come out like I want it to come out. But it doesn't always work like that. I'm not God. I don't know all things. I don't see way out there. But He does. He knows what's best. And so the Spirit will help you to surrender your life to God. And instead of sitting back in a corner and wringing your hands and fearing the things that are coming upon the face of the earth, the Holy Ghost of God can assure you that God has you right in His hand and that all things, all things are going to work out for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. The main goal of the Spirit, the Spirit that we talked about in Romans 8 and 2, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ and we trust in His cross for the forgiveness of our sin, then the Spirit has the legal right to come into our hearts and to our lives daily and lead us and guide us. And He will if we don't continually ignore Him. You can grieve the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Sadly to say, there's a place you can go, read Romans 1 if you don't believe me, that the Spirit will leave you alone. God help me never to get to that place. 
Help me listen to what the Spirit says. The main goal of the Spirit in your life is to carry out God's will in our lives. He wants to bring God's will through in our life, Not our personal will. Christ prayed in the garden, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Christ, with the agony of man as he was in the garden, just hoped that there would be some other way. But God, if there's no other way, not my will, but your will be done. By allowing the Spirit of the Lord to lead us, we will be brought to victory. We will be able to sing that song, Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. We'll be able to sing the old hymn, Victory. Victory today is mine. Oh, hallelujah. Glory be to God. I feel it in my soul. When we hold to that unchanging hand, the Holy Ghost of God will lead us and will bring us into His victory. Now, I want you to read with me. This is a verse of Scripture. Verse 28 that is so taken out of context so many times. And it trips so many people up. Listen. Listen to what he says, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Didn't say was good. Work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did, pre- whom he de- whom he did predestine, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now we're going to talk about these verses here, verse 29 for a moment, and get that out of the way so you can think about what I'm talking about. Verse 29, God's foreknowledge. God knows all things. Do I, do I need to say that again? God knows all things. There is nothing my God does not know and cannot do. It is never, I want you to hear this, This will clear up in your mind. I'm sure these last two verses here might have thrown something a cog there. But listen, this will clear up your mind. It is never the person, but the plan that is predestined. Everyone has a choice. Everyone can come to the plan of salvation. Everyone, whosoever will, let him come. But if they don't, if they refuse, the goodness and forbearance of God, then judgment will surely come their way. Now let's look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. Was it good that Joseph... Sister Norma, thank you for preaching my sermon this morning in Sunday school class. You've you done a great job. If everybody had heard you, I wouldn't have to preach it right now. Was it good that Joseph's own family... Has your family ever hurt you? Family can hurt you like nobody else can hurt you, can't they? These were the brothers that Joseph by being ruler over them, was going to help them. He didn't have no harm for them. I don't believe he went around like he was going to be a ruler over them, but they hated him. Jealousy got their heart, just like he talked about that individual this morning. Sister Norman, jealousy and greed and all these things got in their heart, and they hated Joseph. Was it good that his own family took him and throwed him in the pit? No. Not nothing good about that at all. Don't you know that cut him... To the very bone. Can you imagine how he felt when he was in that pit? Looking at no way out. His own brothers had sold him there. And he just thinks, well, they're going to leave me here till, till I die. What well, Was it good that one brother comes back? And don't you know how Joseph must have felt? Look here. One's come back. He's going to rescue me. 
And he gets him out of the pit and he sells him into slavery. Was that good? No, sir, really. Can you imagine? Can you? But what did Joseph do? Did he sit around pine? Did he say, God, you've given me these visions, you've given me these dreams? How in the world? What's going on? I'm just going to throw up my hands and quit. What's the use? It wasn't good that this happened, but what happened? God got in the arrangements. God got in the circumstances. Was it good that after he had been a faithful servant and raised up and was doing good over all of Potiphar's house, was it good that he was taken and falsely accused and cast in a dungeon? No, sir, you can't find one good thing about it. But God got in the arrangements. God got in the circumstances. And the devil meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You know the story very well how that God raised him up, brought him to the throne used his life to preserve the children of Israel, used his life to preserve the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just being a foreshadow of Christ, that we see Christ in him. And his brothers stand before him, and here's the words that he says. In essence, what he says, the devil are you meant it for evil, but God. My, that puts a shout way down deep in my soul. But God meant it for good. I've seen many times in my life when the devil thought, I've got you. Everything now, look here, where, where's your God at? But God meant it for good. Moses on the backside of the desert, was that good? No. He had been there in Pharaoh's house. Why couldn't have God just used him there in Pharaoh's house? Come on. Don't you think those things didn't go through Moses' mind? But he's on the back side of the desert. But God showed up in the burning bush. God took the circumstance. God took the situations. And he worked it out for the good. Daniel. Was it good he was thrown in a, uh, in a den of lions? Would have been for me, boy, I'd have been, mm, I'd been scratching for the side of that wall. But Daniel trusted God, didn't he? I can see him that night there with those big old kitty cats. I can see him pulling up a couple to hug on and one to lay on. Put his head right there. Had a great night's sleep. Why? Because God. But God. I think about Stephen. Was it good that Stephen was taken and stoned? A man of God, a man who was preaching God's word, a man who was full. The Bible tells us he was full of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Pastor David, he was a man of God. I mean, there was no denying. Stephen stood in their very faces and said, You are the ones who crucified the King of glory, but He is your only hope. He is the only way. And he stood knowing even though they gnashed upon Him with their teeth. Was it good that they stoned Him? No, sir. Did He feel the pain? I believe He felt every stone. Was that good? No, but when He looked up to heaven, God got in the circumstances. God got in the arrangements. And He saw Jesus Christ Himself. <laughs> right there, ready to receive Him unto Himself. And what a witness as a young man stood by by the name of Saul. You see, the devil thought, I'm going to use this. I'm going to shut this thing down. I'm going to shut Stephen's mouth up. He's not going to be able to proclaim Christ. But there's a young man standing there holding coats, giving witness as they stone him. And I believe at that very moment, Paul saw that there was something to Christ Jesus. 
I believe at that moment the Holy Ghost began to convict him and use that moment. And look at what a witness Paul was. Was it good that Paul was cast in prison, him and Silas beaten? Inside that prison, scribes hurting? Was it good? No, sir. If you'd asked him, hey, is this good? They'd said, no. Man, this hurts. This is bad. This is not good. But Tony, I can see what I'd be doing. I'd be sitting there in the corner crying, God, I've preached your word. I've, put, I've stretched my neck out. I've done this and I've done that and I've done the other. And here I am beaten and in prison. God, where are you at? They knew where God was at. They knew God was getting in the arrangements. They knew God was getting in the circumstances. They knew God was working it out for the good and they began to sing. Turn to page 333. I'll fly away, Brother J.C. They began to sing 120. Oh, victory. I know they wasn't made back then, but it's good preaching. They began to sing 120. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. They began to sing, oh, hallelujah. He abides, he abides. Hallelujah, he abides with me. They began to look at one another and say, how about page 390? There is power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. And about that time, the Spirit of God got in the circumstances, got in the situation where it seemed hopeless and it seemed like it was in the end. And that jailhouse began to rock and move and those gates slung open and they were delivered and they were freed by the hand of Almighty God. God will get in the circumstances. You've got situations in your life. I was thinking the other night as I was laying in in the bed, you, you for a moment, look in your life, what God has done in your life. Situations where it seemed like that it'll go no further than here. But God gets in the circumstance. God gets in the situation. That thing that happened was not good. But God works it out for the good. Bad things happen to good people. I'd said years ago, I'll, I'll tell this and I'm going to hush quickly. I'd said years, many, many years ago, as the Lord called me to preach. And Grandpa had started a small church. I might have even been at the bus at that time. It started in a bus. and went to a house. Until they finally built the church, which is now the fellowship hall. And God's blessed us. It's all God. It's all God. All God. To give us the facility that we have here and the wonderful, wonderful people we have here. But I'd said many years ago, I'll never go to Sparta. Don't say things like that. I'm so thankful God sent me here. I said, I'm so thankful God sent me here. And I can remember... The year, and I don't remember the year, it was in the 90s, that the big, a big snow came. And after that snow, rain came. And that snow became so heavy, and it was so deep. They called me, we weren't going to have church that Sunday, I was going to bring the tape up to the radio station so they would have a tape to play. And someone called and said, you might want to check on the picnic shelter behind the church it's fell in fell in and so I pulled up and sure enough it had fell in and we went into the church a moment as I started in the church that old paper insulation I told you a few Sundays ago I won't get in great detail I've learned to hate that stuff it was some of it coming down and I just laughingly said I believe the church roof fell in but as I stepped on in I seen it wasn't no laughing matter it had fell in it, it had collapsed and uh, it was a pretty bad situation. Some people had just quit the church. The, some of those that you lean upon, we didn't have that many anyway. I, I remember going home and telling mom and daddy, man, we had nine in church Sunday. Man, I thought, I thought we had arrived uptown. Didn't realize what God was doing. And I tell you my heart, I'll be honest with you. Can I confess? I'll be honest with you. I was done. I was done. I went out, I wanted to slam the church door. I told you that before, but I was too religious, I reckon, if you would call it that, to slam the church door. But that little Volkswagen rabbit door sort of did catch it. And I wanted to go home, 
the septic tank also had overflowed. And I wanted to go home and, and call the state office and say, you can find the key at such and such, and it's yours. But God. Not the family members didn't encourage that much. But God. Not that many members to encourage. But God. And as I started allowing God, not me, God, to work, God began to move. That summer we had church like you wouldn't believe. Oh, it was hot in there. We had to tire the insulation, all the roof out. Hadn't got the funds and availability yet to replace the roof. We set pews right down the middle of the aisle. I'll never forget it. But God, we had a revival, Brother Don. Brother Gary's daddy. I can see him right now. Raise that little hand up. Mm, can't wait to see him in glory one of these days. Brother Don got saved during that revival. God began to bless. God began to move. God began to work. Other churches, I, I wish I'd have kept records, but Lord, the record, but other churches, I don't remember how many churches it was, stepped in to help us to rebuild and get the roof back on. <clears throat> we kept having church, and when, when we got ready to do it, they were there. We took the roof off. Uh, we raised it. We actually raised the roof. You can see, I'll show it to you sometime. Uh, raised the roof, ended up with a better facility than we had before. Why? Because of God. I was thinking last night, some of y'all remember Sister Brooks. I was thinking last night, she started back, I can show you the spot in the fellowship hall now. We, it was carpet then. And I knew that carpet was running. We didn't have the money to replace carpet. Well, I, mean, we, well, I was so, so thankful. That, that the church was being fixed back up now. And I looked back there and she was with a little old broom. I wish I'd have saved that broom. With a little old broom. The bristles on it done wore out. And she was sweeping. And I started to say, Sister Brooks, you're wasting your time. But then Grandpa, what he had told me, spoke in my ear. The Lord used it. Grandpa always told me if somebody's doing something constructive, leave them alone. I wish a lot of preachers had been told that. If somebody's doing something to lift up and be, leave them alone. Just leave them alone. So I left her alone. We used that carpet until we got new pew. I, it, it cleaned it up. You remember, Brother Gary? It cleaned it up. I mean, there was insulation. There was fiberglass roofing. There was no way that carpet could have been cleaned. But that little old lady with that little old broom cleaned every bit of that carpet. But God. When God gets in the circumstances, the church from that moment began to grow. God began to move. People began to come in. We got to the place, and I'm going to hush, we got to the place that we decided that we were going to have to build. God. That's God. God gets in the circumstances. God gets in the situation. God gets in the arrangement. When it seems like there's no hope and it seems like the devil has the upper hand, don't you throw up your hands and quit and say what's to use. You begin to pray as you've never prayed before and know that God, God Almighty is going to get in the circumstances and He's going to work it out for the good. Amen. Now there's two conditions and I hush. Two conditions that he put in here. The first was to them who love God. You see, if you truly love God, the things of this world don't matter. If you truly love God, the things of this world hold no sway. If you truly love God, the things of this world are put aside. To those who love God was the first condition. And the second condition is to them who are called according to His purpose. Father, whew, glory be to God. I'm so thankful, God, that you get in the arrangements. That you get in the circumstances. That you get in the situation. And you work it out for the good. That problem, that way, that circumstance that I'm facing and I'm standing in, it's not good. But God, when you get in there and begin to work and begin to move, you work it out 
for the good to those who love you and are the called according to your purpose. Help us to see, Lord, the things that are coming upon the face of this earth. Help us, God, not to allow fear. Help us not to allow doubt and unbelief to come into our hearts. But help us to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name. I want us to stand for a moment. I want us to turn to page 120. You go ahead, Brother Robert. Yep. Yep. <laughs> every, every bit of the way. Every bit. He is a God that will turn things around. When it seems like you can't do it and it seems like there's no way, God will make a way. God will make a way. God will make a way. If you have a need this morning, you have a situation, a circumstance, and you don't already feel like that you've got victory over it this morning, this altar is open. Most of all, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, there's no way you can have victory. There's no way you can have true joy in this world without Christ Jesus. Why is drugs and alcohol and all these things on the rise? Because there's no true joy in this world. Only in Christ. This altar is open this morning. Somebody help me find the hymnal here. I know it, but I might forget a word or two. I'm getting older. <clears throat> oh, let's sing it to him this morning. <clears throat> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life Oh, think about it, church. To save a wretch like me.